Hang on. Tell me when to start. Good to go. Hi, everybody. Welcome. My name is Sue Brum. I am co-owner of CE Technologies. Thank you for attending today to learn about the dark web at Cafe Dark Web. We have a lot to cover, so let's get started. Um, I first wanted to mention that the question and answer section is open, so please feel free to put your questions in there throughout the webinar, and we do have time dedicated at the end to answer all of your questions. As you can see, we have a great panel of speakers today, starting with Fred Brum from CE Technologies, John Roman from Fox Point Solutions, and Steve Stazakonis from Secure Network Technologies. In addition, we have Andrew Gleisman from CE Tech that's gonna help us with the uh, question and answers. Today we're going to cover, Fred is going to talk to us about how easily you can be compromised and how easy it is to get to people's data. Steve is gonna take us on a tour of the internet's underbelly, which is the dark web. And John is gonna to talk to us about compliance and how it can actually save your business. So probably a lot of you've heard about the dark web, but for those that don't know about the dark web, uh, the picture here is showing the internet and where you and I use uh, the internet is up at the top at the surface web. This is Google, Amazon, Facebook, YouTube, Instagram. And then in the middle there, we have the deep web, which is used uh, mostly for uh, academia, medical, financial, and government purposes. And then at the bottom, you can see the dark web. And that's the part of the internet that is accessible by means of special software or tools. And it really allows the users and operators to remain anonymous or virtually untraceable. So what's out on the dark web? And as I just mentioned, it allows criminals to remain anonymous. You can buy and sell names, addresses, phone numbers. You can buy and sell stolen credit cards, security numbers. You can even buy healthcare records. And of course, you can buy and sell user IDs and passwords. So think about this. Think about if you have an employee that is using their business credentials personally and using them on personal sites. And if those sites are compromised, your business is compromised. So Steve is gonna to talk to us about what's on the dark web. This is some of it and some of the other crazy stuff that's out on the dark web. So ultimately we're gonna cover is how to avoid being a sitting duck and to protect everything that you've worked so hard to achieve. And as a bonus for uh, participating today, we are gonna be providing, um, offering everyone a complimentary dark web scan to see if your business credentials are actually out on the dark web. And in addition, we'll provide you a ransomware guide from CISA, which is the Cybersecurity and Information Security Agency, which is part of Homeland Security. So why is this topic important to your company? You are the caretaker of a lot of personal data, your company, your employees, your clients, your vendors, and not paying attention at the right time will cost you your livelihood. And if you wanna be in business in 2021, there are things you need to know to stay in business. And unfortunately, the bad news is you're gonna to need to start budgeting more for your IT uh, by 2022 because of the stuff we're talking about today due to cybercrime and regulations. So for now, I'm gonna turn it over to Fred Brum, who is co-owner of CE Technologies with me. And we do IT infrastructure design support and operations heavily focused on cybersecurity. We are locally owned and operated. And I am proud to say that we were voted the winner of the RBJs, the Rochester Business Journal's best IT outsource company and best cybersecurity company. So with that, I'll turn it over to Fred. Thanks, Sue. Can you, can you guys see me on screen? Yes. Yep. Awesome. Okay. So I'm going to talk about a, a internet tool that's out. It's been actually been out on the internet since 2009, and it's um it's free to use. It, it's a public tool. It doesn't cost anything to use, and and it's uh, the name is Shodan, and the and the website is Shodan.com, and I'm going to show you how um, publicly available tools combined with the dark web could be putting your company at risk. Why am I showing you this tool? Well, in IT, the details matter. Whether you're a CIO, CFO, business owner, or the IT guy, you need to pay attention to the details. 
because it's not difficult to make a living as a cyber criminal anymore. It's actually very easy. There's tools out there. I'm going to show you one, showdan.com, that's free and it's available for public use. If you're not doing IT right, then your company is an easy target. And as a matter of fact, hundreds and thousands of companies are an easy target. So I'm going to put on my hacker hat real quick and, and tell you how, as a hacker, I might make some money, right? And so here's the, here's the basic premise. Um, I'm a hacker. I'm going to get into a company network, and I'm going to encrypt a server, and I'm going to hold that server for ransom. And you, as the business owner, are going to pay that ransom, and, um, and then uh, I'm going to go out and have lunch. So this is the uh, this is the website Shodan.com, and um, unlike you know, so you can go to Google and search for all sorts of stuff, but what you use Shodan to search for are things that are out on the internet. So you can see that uh, on the left, I've got industrial control systems, um, databases, video games. Is Fred? Is that uh, default passwords that come with like standard equipment? Default passwords? Can you get those? Yeah, so Andrew, you're actually you're poking at a couple of these um, these other searches that are available out here that people have created. This this search here is um, if you click on this box, you'll get all the devices that are on the internet with the default password. Um, as a matter of fact, you know you, you've also got some canned. Uh, you can actually search for things like uh, cameras that are out there on the internet. And so if I click on that, I can see you know here's somebody's backyard, um, somebody's foyer. I've got looks like a, a business restaurant. Um, this is somebody actually walking up the front porch. And these are, these are just snapshots. They're not live, but you can see that they're relatively new, right? Um, this is uh, probably right now, as a matter of fact. Um, but I'm gonna click on uh, industrial control systems, right up here at the top. And when I go there, I can see that it's narrowed it down to, they've got two spotlight um, hardware devices. One is this wind turbine. The other is a license plate reader. I'm gonna click on the wind turbine and I, I've got a, a three that actually show up. And if I click on the top one, um, I get a little bit of information from Shodan. I can see the ports and, um, you know, ports are like communication uh, mechanisms out on the internet. I have services here and, and all sorts of information about this, this, um, this wind turbine. As a matter of fact, it also tells me the vulnerabilities of the operating system of the wind turbine. And, in, and as a matter of fact, for this particular uh, wind turbine, there's about 30 different vulnerabilities. So Fred, is that, that the, I'm sorry to interrupt, but is the University of Oregon where the turbine is located? Yeah, that's an estimate. That's an estimation. It could be exactly right. Um, okay. But uh, it is showing up with DNS, University of Oregon. Wow. So I'm going to go ahead and click right on the IP address of the wind turbine. And you can see that uh, I, can, I can actually see um, a web page. I get the, uh, the wind speed. Uh, it doesn't look like it's very windy today. I get the wind direction. I get some information about that wind turbine. But th this was without a password. Um, and so in order for me to get, to get paid, right, this is, this is what this opportunity might look like. So I don't have a password to the wind turbine. I need to put on my hacker hat. And, um, and I'm going to break into that wind turbine, right? I'm going to use those security flaws and, uh, and hack into that device. And then I'm going to hack into the, um, the company firewall. Once I get into the company firewall, I'm on that company network. And, um, and, and that's pretty good, but I'm not home free yet. I need to hack into that server. I, I need to find a server and hack into it. But once I'm on that server, I'm going to go ahead and encrypt that and uh, demand, demand Bitcoin. And, um, and that's where I get paid. And so that's what that sequence looks like. Is that the only thing I can do as a hacker, just launch a ransomware attack? Or can I plant like time bombs or something that go off late at a later date in time? Yeah, there's all kinds of things. Once you get into that server, there's all kinds of um, fun and games that you can do in a, in a company network. That's a good point, John. It doesn't, also doesn't look like it's as simple as I expected. That's how it looks complex. Yeah, I, that's a good lob. Andrew, um, it's actually very complex. As a matter of fact, you almost need a PhD to figure out some of that, that some of that stuff. Um, so let's let's see if we can simplify it a little bit better. Um, so I'm I'm back to show Dan, and um, this time I'm going to search for Sonic Walls devices in Moscow. And um, if you don't know what a Sonic Wall device is, it's a it's a router that protects your company network. Um, and Sonic Wall is actually a very popular router. 
Um, but it also has the capability of letting employees remote access to the company through a technology called VPN. And you might be using that at your company now, especially with COVID, you might have a lot of VPN users that are getting into the company network to do, to do their work. Um, but let's see if I, this is a search of sonic wall devices in Moscow, and each one of these red dots indicates a sonic wall device. Let's see if I can search from Moscow for sonic wall devices in, in the United States. And you can see that I've got quite a few more hits um, for sonic wall devices in the United States. It's actually a very popular router in the United States. I'm going to go ahead and click on one of these sonic walls on the west coast and it's going to bring me to uh, a sonic wall that's in San Francisco. Um, it's, they're doing a good job of patching the sonic wall. There's no security flaws. But when I go to that web page, I actually get the logon page for the sonic wall. And um, a couple of things that I can tell is when I click on the domain drop down box, the domain name for this sonic wall is t.local, which leads me to believe that this is a T company. But a little bit more information from Shodan, I look at the, the VPN SSL certificate and it tells me that it's registered to tcollection.com. And therein lies my company, right? This is the company that owns this sonic well. It's, a, it's not a tea company. As a matter of fact, it's a clothing company for kids. And um, by the way, they had a Cyber Monday sale uh, last Monday, 30% off if, you, if you, uh, you need to buy kids clothing. I don't know if this sale is still on. Um, but as a hacker, this is very enticing to me. I can see the Sonic wall. I, I know how to log in. I just don't have a password to log into this site. But this looks like a thriving business. I bet if I can encrypt their network and get in, they're going to pay me because they don't want to be down during the holidays. So I'm going to look up, uh, I'm going to do a little bit of research on T Collection and, and I go right to LinkedIn and I can see that this is almost 400 employees. And all of a sudden this, um, this got pretty tasty for me as a hacker. Um, I, I click on the employees and, and I can see the list of almost 400 employees and I just need one of them to give me their password and I'm into that network. I could target, this is Lee Rodden, I could target her and try to get her password. But I, I looked at her profile on LinkedIn and she's one of the originators. She's an owner of the company. I'm guessing she's been through cybersecurity training and she knows how to tell a phishing email from a different email. I don't think she's a good target. I'm gonna look down the list a little bit and I find Jeanette. Jeanette just looks like Jeanette just started with the company and I'm betting that she doesn't know the security protocols of that company. She doesn't know that um, you know, if somebody sends her an email that says, hey, I'm from Microsoft, click on this button and give me your password to reset your password. She probably doesn't know that that's gonna to go to me, a hacker. Um, so you can see where I've gone from seven steps down to five. I now have a password. I can get onto the network through the portal that Shodan showed me, which means I could probably get onto a server. And if I can get onto the server, I can, as John mentioned, I can cause all kinds of trouble, even encrypt that server and demand the ransom. And that's how I'm going to get paid. And I think, Fred, I think it's also important to note that most data breaches, a hacker is on the network undetected for over 45 days. So once they're on the network, they have plenty of time to do bad things because oh my gosh. the detection is, is a lot of time before somebody knows um, that somebody else has been routing around the network. Yeah, John, that's a really good point because you know the you know this this scam that we're talking about uh, kind of depends on there being backups, right? And so if I can get on the network and maybe corrupt the backups, then I have a better chance of getting paid. Or maybe if I can get the data out of the network and tell um, Lee Ross and hey, I'm going to expose all of your customers out on the internet if you don't pay the ransom. That's probably a, a good way to get paid as well. So that's a good point, John. And, and the problem with paying a ransom, everybody, and you could thank the, the federal government for this, is uh, last month, the federal government said that if any company that pays a ransom and that ransom goes to a terrorist organization, the FBI and the Department of Justice is going to go after that company for paying the ransom. Now, the challenge is trying to figure out whether the ransom actually went to a terrorist organization. So not only are you in a bind that you paid a ransom of $100,000, but if the federal government finds out that the ransom went to Al Qaeda, they're also going to, people are probably going to go to jail. Thanks, John. 
I've got it down to five steps. Let's see if I can make it a little bit easier because really that still requires that I get a password or I'm a pretty good hacker. And, and I did say it was easy. So let's see how it could be easy using some free tools out on the internet. Um, what if I could actually buy passwords? If I could buy company passwords, just like I would buy baseball cards, right? What if that were possible? And the fact of the matter is, is that it is possible now. And that's what the dark web is. You see, when Facebook got hacked, all of their passwords showed up on the dark web for sale. When Marriott got hacked, their passwords showed up on the dark web for sale. And just like Sue mentioned, if, you're, if your employees are using their Bugs Bunny password on Facebook and their Bugs Bunny password at the office, then there's a good chance somebody's going to get into your network and wreak some havoc. So what does this look like, right? So I'm going to go to, I'm going to get it down to three steps, which is pretty simple. I'm going to buy some passwords on the dark web. I'm going to hack into the server console and I'm going to encrypt it. And then I'm going on vacation. So how might this work? I'm going to go right back to show Dan and I'm going to do a search for not looking for Aruba networks. I'm not looking for SonicWall networks. I'm not looking for Sofo, Sofos hardware. I'm looking for remote access, right? Um, remote access gives me almost 4 million hits. And you can see there's quite a few right in the, in, the, in the central New York area. So let's see what those look like, right? So I go to the first one and um, I get the open ports, just like we mentioned. I can also see the vulnerabilities, right? And there's quite a few for this server. Um, but when I go down a little bit, I can actually see the console of the server. And not only does this show me the console, but what this, what this means to me is I could remote right to this server console from my desktop right now. As a hacker, I don't know if this is a home computer or if this is just some kid out on the network, but guess what, right here, says this user is Sage FTP. And Sage I know is an accounting database. And as a hacker, if I can encrypt a, an accounting database, there's a good chance they're gonna pay to get that database unencrypted, right? Because it's got customer information, it's got vendor information. All I need now is I need to know who, who this company, who this server belongs to, right? What company? And if I look down, Shodan tells me that the, the uh, the company is most likely the CDLC company. And if I do a quick search, CDLC is most likely this Capital District Library Council. And if I could buy the passwords for this company, I could jump right on the server console. I'm gonna give you another example. This one's a little bit interesting. This one's patched, so they did a good job of, you know, IT did a good job of patching it. But again, right on the server console, and I can see that this is a company, US Fluids. And so if I go to usfluids.com, this is, this, is uh, this is a manufacturing company. And if I, you know, I could look up information about these people. Go ahead, John. Nope, I'm sorry. You're good, okay. It's background noise, sorry, sorry. No problem. And then the last example um, I've got here is, uh, is another server that's out on the internet. You know, here's the patches that are, I'm sorry, here's the security vulnerabilities that are missing on this server. As a matter of fact, it's a Windows 2008 server, which shouldn't even be turned on. Um, Microsoft has stopped patching Windows 2008. And right here from the logon screen, I can see this belongs to an SBSD company. And if I do a, a quick search on SBSD, this is, this is some poor landscaping company who has um, relied on their IT to keep them secure. Um, but unfortunately, uh, their server is just exposed right out on the internet. And guess what? There's almost 4 million more. Um, and so this is a big problem. And this is why we're doing this, this webinar is, is to, to, to let you all know as business owners, you need to pay attention to the details, right? The details matter. It's not difficult to make a living as a cyber criminal. I just showed you in three easy steps how somebody could get into your network and hold your, your data for ransom. And if you're not doing IT right, then your company is an easy target. Um, but now you know, right? You, thank you for coming to this webinar. It's time to, um, to do something about it. As Sue mentioned, we focus on cybersecurity. As a matter of fact, we were voted um, the number one cybersecurity uh, company in Rochester. And if you have any questions or you have any needs, you can reach me anytime at fbrum at cetechno.com. Um, I'm gonna introduce you to Steve. Steve likes to say that I put the kindling down and he pours gasoline on the fire and his presentation is, is pretty cool. Um, Steve is a managing partner of Secure Network Technologies. They do penetration testing and uh, incident response. Um, take it away, Steve. Cool, all right, so I'll share my screen here. That's okay. And um, 
real quick here. Let's see if this starts to work. All right, so just get rid of the title page here. So everybody wants to know what happens kind of like after you've been hacked. And we do a lot of incident response. We deal with a lot of companies that get breached. And you know the, the horror stories of what happened kind of start with this. This is a ransom note from an actual customer. They got ransomed, they got hit for two and a half million dollars. Now, if you look at the ransom note quickly, it says they want a million two five for the unlocking solution and another million two five for the data destruction. That means that they took your data. And when they take your data, this is where the nightmare begins because your data is now being held hostage. And if you recover from backups, you're good to go. But if you're not sure if they took your data, you know, now you got to figure out, are you willing to pay this? You will, you know, you're going to play that bluff. So unfortunately, this particular company, they said, you know, what are the chances of them actually taking all this information? Well, they didn't pay. And unfortunately, when that happens, you get shamed on a site like this. This is a site called Maze. Now it's like mazenews.io. They change their, the, the, the ending on this thing all the time. It's, it's a bulletproof hosted site. So it moves around. They shame the company of who got hit, how much data they took, the usernames, the passwords, the customer data, all this stuff. Now, the shaming doesn't stop here. What happens is since you didn't pay your ransom, and by the way, you can't trust the guys because if they stole your data, chances are, you know, yeah, they're going to take the money for the destruction of it. But I can assure you, these guys are unscrupulous. They're going to sell your stuff. They don't care. So unfortunately, you can never be sure if you pay them chances are your data is still at large and it's gonna be stolen. And, and finding your data on the dark web is interesting because a lot of people say, well, you know, can a company get ransomed and they call us up and they say, our data was probably stolen. Can you find it on the dark web and destroy it? Well, that, that just doesn't happen. Your data is bought and sold, bought and sold. And, and finding data on the dark web is a lot more difficult than people think. In fact, nothing's free on the dark web. So if you see an ad, you know, that comes in from like, you know, LifeLock with Rudy Giuliani saying, you know, we're going to scan the dark web every day for your data. Rudy, it's not quite accurate. All right. Hopping down in the dark web and then running some tools to find data. It just doesn't work that way. You got to go to dark markets. You got to go into these environments. And ultimately, the dark markets is where they're going to sell your data. That's there's a price tag on it. So to get into the dark markets, you got to go down there through some hoops and a lot of people figure, well, I'm just going to do some Google searches and, you know, type in stuff like, you know, my data is stolen. But, you know, if you start typing in stuff like that or illegal drugs, stolen guns, fake passports, probably a bad idea. You know, black SUV might show up at your house. So that's not the way to get to the dark web. The dark web works one way and it requires a plug in from Tor for Tor. And it's the onion routing network. You can get it from Firefox or for Firefox. You download it and, and then it gives you the vehicle to get down in there. I'm not saying you should do this from your home computer, your work computer, preferably a burner computer is a way to do this. Don't use your own email. You got to take some controls. But, but once you're down there, your conventional search engines aren't going to work. All right. The tools that you've normally used to surf the web, it just it doesn't function. So when you're down inside there, you know, you got to figure out where to go. Um, nobody's going to point you off at where your data is. Now, there used to be sites like this, and this is one called deep.web. Now, these guys, they were on the open internet. You could go there. If you want to score a kilo of cocaine, you're going to go to a drug vendor. They're going to show you where to go. You want to go buy data, they're going to show you where to go. You want to buy malware, crimeware, they're going to show you where to go. Now, what happened with these guys is they were actually taking a kickback from the dark markets. Unfortunately, our government and the FBI, they didn't think that was appropriate. So they busted these guys. They got shut down. Less than 24 hours later, there's a site called dark.fail. You just go there. He explicitly says that we don't get any money for doing this, but he'll show you where to go. If you want to score some cannabis, if you want to do something deceitful, these are the places to go. And they give you the onion links, which are constantly changing. They'll show you the sites that are online, offline, and so on. And these are the folks that really, if you want to start doing some your own investigation, you go to these sites. Now, when you go to these sites, Steve, Steve yes. did they actually do like uh, five-star reviews of those? On your last slide, they actually did five-star reviews of how well they provide that data. Oh, absolutely. In fact, they, they try to make the experience as Amazon ask as they can. So a good example, there was a site called Empire Market, and I was buying data and I was going through there because that's what I do. 
So you escrow your Bitcoin in this dark market. I don't use my real name. I go by an alias. I use a Proton Mail account to hide my email. And then what you do is you throw your money inside that bucket. And then when you find a dark market vendor and you score some contraband, by the way, I was buying, I'm buying data. I'm not buying like drugs or like, you know, hydrochloroquine or something. So Steve, I, but I would, how can we be sure? <laughs> I don't because like because John, I have it all sent to your house. That's Sorry. how you yes, be yeah. sure. Okay, so when you great. see a package there, it's oh, probably that's something. Oh, the package that I'm going to get. Exactly. Okay. That, yeah, you. that wasn't right. a holiday gift. Is it um, discreet? It was discreet. <laughs> yeah. But yeah, it was very interesting. But I, I got burned by a vendor. I bought some data. I wanted to get the latest, you know, usernames and passwords that were probably compromised at some companies. And, and the guy never delivered. And I, I was kind of ticked off. So I went to the vendor at Empire Market and I said, hey, man. This guy burned me. Lo and behold, they actually gave me my Bitcoin back. I was shocked. So, you know, the guy, did, he got a one-star review, but I had to take five stars for Empire Market. Now, Empire Market got, they shut themselves down. So they, they, they probably walked off with well over, I'd say, $50 million in Bitcoin belonging to guys like me. So you're, you're dealing with such a criminal element. You know, once again, you know, don't put your faith in the five-star reviews. Yeah, they'll say if they deliver. But ultimately, chances are you will get burned and you might get burned by the dark market vendor themselves. So it's amazing. But you got to weed through both lists. I would have loved to have done this demo live. The problem is you go to these markets, you may search on data and you will come across the biggest stash of illegal pornography. We're trying to keep the presentation G rated. I, I can't do that. So um, we got some screenshots here. So when you're down there and, and they're not going to let you in just willy-nilly you're going to have to log in with an alias you're going to go through a series of captchas it's going to be painful might use a pgp key but once you're in you can start searching so if you want to score a, you know, a machine gun you're good to go you know if you want to buy drugs there are a boatload of drug sites that are down there everything from pharmaceuticals to coke to heroin uncut whatever i mean once again you're, you're taking your life in your hands when you're taking this stuff and ingesting it but people obviously they buy and they use it because there wouldn't be a market if, if these guys wouldn't be that many. There wouldn't be that many of them. If you're having a failed marriage, you want to off your spouse. You know, there's a hitman service. Once again, you don't know if you're dealing with an assassin from Chechnya or a U.S. marshal or an FBI agent. One, you know, one of those buyer beware situations here. But there's everything down there. This is from Buscoloni Market. That's that's in the web or dark hey, web. Steve, Steve, yeah. I love that I on that page. I could I could mark that as a favorite. <laughs> you, you could you could mark it as a favorite. Actually, it's interesting here too. I think he says that he's on vacation right now. You can't contact. Him. How much? How much is it? Um, I think that's those are up for. I think it's up for negotiation. You know, you got to pull down there. Discreet overnight stealth uh, stealth shipping, hundred twenty eight point five five euro. <laughs> so Not guess, exactly. What's that? So I guess bad guys do have pretty good customer service skills and they seem like they're pretty, uh, you know, they, they really care about their customers given you got your Bitcoin back. This market, I'm not too sure. Empire market did reimburse me. I, I was, I, and they don't want scammers. I mean, the markets don't want to get burned because they're making a piece of the action off the guys that are selling through them. Um, but, you know, once again, you know, is this real? I, I'm not sure. You know, would I contact them? Hell no. You know, I don't need some black SUV showing up and saying, hey, what's up, Steve? You know, so you, you just you never know. It's interesting, though. He does a website link there to a firearm site. I, I don't know. A lot of these guys will communicate through like Proton Mail, which is anonymous through Switzerland, Gorilla Mail. Sometimes they'll use, use Jabber, which is encrypted uh, chat sessions. Um, so everything is available down there. I mean, this is one of the sites in Wall Street Market where I go to a lot. Malware and Crimeware. And, and that's why hacking now is so it's 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 so popular is because you don't have to be some you know really smart guy to, to leverage doing this it's you buy a crimeware kit you download it and then you you figure out how to use it some of these guys will sell you a, a, a video to actually you know step you through the process they'll sell you support so if you want to like use a new version of some ransomware kit They'll say, help us, you know, you want help, just pay us and we'll give you a feed that gives you all the things that you need to get up and running. And these places, I mean, there is just a boatload of it down there. The other thing too is- um, Hey Steve, I think I to, saw, I think I saw, can you go back to that other page? I, I was looking yeah. through your list there. I could buy a Android mobile virtual fraud bags card, $29 a piece, or a Wi-Fi automated cracker for 490, for five bucks I could crack somebody's Wi-Fi? 
once again, these are all tools that are out there. They've probably been bought and sold so much. There's, there's a boatload of stuff. And I mean, you, you can buy aren't anything. There now, aren't there now malware as a service offerings where you don't even need to download a kit? You just subscribe to a site and you can launch a malware attack from a site, right? You don't need to even have any technical yeah. capability. Yeah, they'll sell you, like you can, either, you, could, you can either buy the Bulletproof hosting site. So it's in like... Remember the old Soviet Union when the Iron Curtain fell, the .su domain vanished. We thought it vanished. That is like the domain of the bad guy. So if you want a bulletproof hosted site, they'll spin up a stock or spin up a server for you. Um, companies like flowspec.ru are ones you can go to and you could do anything you want. You want to DDoS, DDoS somebody from there. You want to build a shopping site for the dark web. You want to do something that's nefarious. The guys in Russia, I mean, they'll use the .su domain. And there's a, there's, there's, there's a lot of them out there. This was interesting. At the bottom of this, you'll see Bank of America Business Mobile Exploit. I tried to buy that. The guy never delivered on that either. And, uh, but it was a mobile exploit for taking advantage of Bank of America customers that bank on their phone. Kind of wanted to see what that was all about. Um, and there's pages upon pages. And once again, not all this stuff is legit. You probably will get burned a couple of times. I've been burned several times. We'll tell you. For $8, I scored the best crime work kit of my life. It was like, I think like seven gigabytes of data and it had a bonus pack of other stuff. And it gave me Photoshop templates that I could use to counterfeit currency, whether it was dollars, euros, Canadian dollars, pesos, anything I wanted. Had a bomb making kit inside there. I mean, there was some pretty scary stuff. Um, How about a free subscription to Netflix for a year? You, can buy those. <laughs> and you know what? You laugh. You laugh. There's, there is a boatload. You want Netflix? They'll have it out there. You want uh, a Prime account? You could get it. Um, recently, Bank just got nailed. They were going through their bank, and uh, this bank was doing an audit on themselves. And they said, we have all these unusual accounts that have been established. And then we've noticed that like 100 to 300 bucks gets put inside of them. Nothing happens for, let's say, three to four months. And then all of a sudden, $20,000 goes in and then gets wired out to some obscure country. Well, what that is, it's, got, it's called a bank drop account. And that drop account is actually then put together by a threat actor. He throws 100 bucks inside there. He uses the identity of, what they call, of a deceased person or what they call a synthetic person. That synthetic person doesn't exist. And what happens is, is it gets sold on the dark web. So if you ransom somebody, all right, and you want to cash out, well, you convert your Bitcoin into cash, you put it in the, in the drop account. And then what happens is from there, you can move the money offshore. And these guys found out they had like, I think three or $400,000 in all these different drop accounts that were established. The bank freaked out. I mean, they were like, we're facilitating money laundering uh, you know, illegal transactions of currency. I mean, the, the list went on. So everything is for sale. You want a Netflix account? You know what, John? Merry Christmas. I'll get one for you. Okay. You're going to have to log in as like somebody else, but you know what? Just don't remember me. Okay. Just make the email address F Brum and no, I'm only <laughs> Got it. All right. Um, but yeah, so, so here's, here's compromised data. I mean, the minute, and this stuff gets bought and sold, bought and sold. So we check, what's the latest hack we heard about? All right, the latest one was a FireEye. All right, Mandy ain't got compromised yesterday. We heard about it, it's been all over the news. They stole their tools. When somebody else gets hacked and usernames and passwords get collected, all that stuff gets patched, it gets packaged up. And what happens is it's initially sold as what they call as FULLS, F-U-L-L-Z. That's the latest and greatest data. You know, when it gets finally, you know, bought and sold to the point that it's worn out, it gets packaged up like this, and then it gets sold in bulk for $9 a piece, 593 million email addresses and passwords. After the true white collar criminals are done with their deed, then what they do after that person's been burned, they make more money by packaging it up as, as just something for somebody else to use for either spamming them, taking advantage of something else. Maybe there was a username and password that wasn't used by another threat actor. They leveraged that. This is all over the place. So it's like, like I said, it's a very Amazon-esque experience. You know, you purchase it by go to the offer, you buy it, you go to this type, like this is Chase Bank Logs with email access. I was going to hey, buy Steve, I got, I got to point this out. There's a warning at the top that says, be careful of phishing attacks. Yeah. <laughs> These guys, the, the dark markets have security built into their products. They're like, you know, because they're constantly on the run. This is like a bunch of moonshiners moving there still every day. All right. 
And, and that's what happens. So they're always telling you disable JavaScript. All right, be careful of phishing attacks. You know, they'll, they'll actually notice, they'll notice your browser was a, with a certain plugin and they'll say, hey, stop doing that. And they'll let you know. Once again, these guys are out to make money. But once you're at this point, it's just like you guys buying something from some online vendor. You buy it with Bitcoin, you proceed with checkout. And then within your shopping cart experience, you're going to get notified. And the notification says, hey, here's your download. Now what happens is you have a download link and you're not downloading it from, let's say, the dark market. They, don't, they send you off to New Zealand and they send you to mega.com. Now, mega.com is owned by kim.com. The guy changed his name to kim.com, believe it or not. So this wackadoodle, he's the guy in, in New Zealand that, that has been, you know, he's been in trouble with all these different violations of copyright and stolen data, child porn. I mean, who knows what's, what's on this site? But the minute you get your link from the dark market vendor, they send you over here, kim.com, he's the keeper of all the contraband. You download it from here and then you have your data. And that's how simple it is. And sometimes when it's a lot of data, you gotta pay kim.com because he throttles the download. The guy's a real stinker. So, I mean, that's what you're dealing with. Another, another kind of exposed criminal element, but this is where a lot of this stuff ends up. It's so easy to buy. Now, you know, if you suspect that if you if you suspect that your data was stolen, um, you have an obligation to report. And and we deal with companies all the time that go through this, and they'll say, "Yeah, my stuff was probably stolen. You know, we're just going to nuke the environment and start over." It's like, yeah, but what about all the people that were part of that that breach, the customers you had? It's like, yeah, I hope that never gets out. You know, that's the first thing you'll you. Trying to save your reputation to a company is usually going to be the first priority. Nobody wants to disclose, but there's an obligation. And I'm going to let John explain your obligation to report because some states have got some teeth. And, and John, this is kind of where you got to call John Roman. When this stuff happens, you really got to figure out you know, what your obligations are. So I'm going to stop sharing and uh, I'm going to let John you know, continue on from here. John, you can start anytime. It's all right. <laughs> I mean, I, I, I was so, uh, Steve, I, I'm, you literally scared me and I'm a security guy. So I know, I, I should, I'm just, good. <laughs> I'm speechless for the first time. And for those of you that know me, it's pretty uh, rare that I don't have anything to say. Anyways, for those of you who don't know me, I'm John Roman. I'm responsible for a group within uh, Bonadio uh, called Fox Point Solutions. And uh, now that uh, Steve and Fred have sufficiently scared everybody, I'm going to talk a little bit about, so what do we need to do to reduce the risk of bad things happening? Uh, because we're never going to prevent it, right? The only way to prevent it is don't own a computer and don't connect to the internet. And that's not reality. But there are some ways uh, that we can uh reduce the risk of, of some of these things that Fred uh, and Steve have talked about. So an information security plan is all about protecting the confidentiality, integrity, and availability of data, right? And why do people need information security? And companies of all sizes our targets. The common misconception that I hear the most, and I'm sure Fred and Steve will agree, is my company's too small to be hacked, right? Uh, only large companies get hacked. But the reality is there are hacking tools running across the internet right now as we speak that identify a vulnerability. And once they find the vulnerability, the tool uh, notifies the hacker, and then the hacker tries to exploit the vulnerability to break in. These tools are indiscriminate. They're not discriminating against a 10-person company or a 10-million person company. So, um, and, and part of our job is how do we, how to reduce the risk of that happening and uh, lower kind of our, our uh, uh, risk threats. So, first, we need to stay out of the news, right? The worst thing Thing that can happen is, especially for a small to medium-sized business, 
as you're on the local news because not only did you get hacked and held for ransomware, but the hacker also released all of your customers' data uh, on, on the web. Number two, and as Steve has mentioned, is there are various laws, regulations, and standards, such as PCI for payment card industry, New York Shield for New York resident private information, and New York State Department of Financial Services for uh, financial information, all of which have some pretty significant teeth in terms of fines, which we'll get to in a second. Um, uh, and that finally is avoiding, uh, trying to avoid monetary impact. So not only the fines that are involved, but if something bad happens, guess what? You're gonna hire an attorney. I used to work for a pretty large uh, law firm uh, and our data security and privacy practice. And uh, let me tell you, the rates that we would charge clients who were breached were not insignificant. They were anywhere from 500 to $750 per hour. Uh, also a loss of productivity, right? So there's operational issues that are associated with a ransomware attack. So let's say we decide we're not gonna pay the ransom and we're gonna restore from backup. Uh, depending upon the size of your company, a restoration from backup could take four hours for a very small company up to days. So can you afford to be without your computers and network for days or even weeks? And then finally, there's reputation, right? Uh, everybody on this call has been affected by the Equifax breach. If you apply for credit, chances are Equifax was involved. So now all of our social security numbers out there. Um, do you really have a lot of faith in Equifax? Um, now, all that bad news, now we're in a pandemic. So COVID-19 has elevated everything, right? Hackers take advantage of vulnerabilities, not just technical vulnerabilities, but also uh, physical vulnerabilities, right? And the pandemic is no, um, no exception to that rule. How many fake sites have been launched since the beginning of March that people have gone to to click on, hey, there's a new vaccine hey, click here for the magic vitamin that prevents COVID-19. And as soon as you click on that link, you're infected. Another thing that COVID has brought to us, uh, both for the benefit as well as not, is work from home. Uh, in March, uh, almost the entire state was working from home, right? So there are uh, a ton of vulnerabilities that uh, most likely not knowing that in our haste, to get our employees to work from home, we may have inadvertently placed a vulnerability on a remote access server. Uh, we use virtual conferencing. And if you remember back in March, uh, Zoom, there were a ton of what was called Zoom bombs, right? Because Zoom wasn't the most secure video conferencing application in the world. Uh, and then personal devices. So for those people who use their personal device to, to access a company network, how does the IT staff of that company or the IT staff provider, like a CE tech, for instance, know that you are protecting your personal device uh, because their personal device is accessing the network? And ransomware is not going anywhere. So as the chief information officer of Bonadio, I get asked by uh, vendors all the time, what keeps you up at night? Absolutely nothing. When my head hits the pillow, I fall asleep. Uh, what worries me the most, though, and as Fred and Steve have talked about, is a ransomware attack uh, because of the devastation it causes in terms of A, not detecting it, or B, even after it's detected, the effects of being down for a period of time. So, okay, um, uh, what's an information security program? It's pretty simple. An information security program, as I mentioned, is all about protecting the confidentiality, integrity, and availability of your data. Uh, in New York State, it's protecting resident information, New York State resident information. A sound information security program is kind of like a three-legged stool. Um, it involves administrative, physical, and technical safeguards. John, it involves, John, John, yeah. John, John. Yeah. You're talking about it. You just took this presentation into the toilet. We got all this fancy mumbo jumbo, and now you're talking about a program. 
what is this? A paper? This is boring. This is a paper document and process, policies and procedures. Nobody wants to hear this. You know, Fred, I can always count on you to be the voice of reality. So thank you very much. I, I, I mean, people have already figured out that this part of the presentation probably isn't the most exciting in the world. But I, I appreciate you pointing this out. The, the, uh, the reality, though, is, yeah, it's not sexy. Uh, it's not implementing a new firewall but it is necessary. Uh, I mentioned PCI, DFS, and New York Shield all require an information security program, all require annual risk assessments, policies and procedures, employee security awareness training, et cetera. So yeah, this does not get, for those of you who have an IT staff, this does not get IT staffs jazzed up about writing policies and procedures. That's why Fox Point is in business. Uh, <laughs> um, uh, and oh, by the way, there are significant fines. We'll use New York State DFS. So for, for those of you who are like Fred that says this is boring, um, New York State DFS, if you do not have an information security program in place, if you get breached and that breach affects financial information, the fines are up to $5,000 per record. Now, a record is an account number. A record is a social security number. We all know that we store gigabytes, if not terabytes of information. So $5,000 per, per. An additional $1,000 per if it violates anything else that might be involved in DFS. So if you look at if you had 250,000 records breached under DFS, everybody could do the math, right? It's pretty significant. So yeah, it's a little boring, but it's also a necessary evil. And without it, you don't have a, a you, just using technology is not gonna help. So uh, the first thing that all of these rules and requirements, um, regulations require is a risk assessment. How do you know what to protect if you don't know, A, what you have and how to protect it and the risk associated with it? So uh, risk assessments are all about impact and probability. Uh, what's the impact of social security numbers being breached? And what's the probability of that happening? And then the risk that's left over after you have some controls in place, whether those controls are policy related, technology related, et cetera. But all all information security programs start with a risk assessment. And oh, by the way, are performed uh, annually at a minimum. The second is policy and procedure development. Uh, these are my top, right? If I were going to start small, these are the ones that are the most common and will probably suffice. I'm all about, you know, crawling, walking, and running. Uh, let's not create the 50 million NIST 800 policies that are out there. Let's start small um, and get people uh, get people used to these policies. Hey John, I kind I kind of gathered like your two slides ago, right? You had that cartoon on the right. You're basically saying focus on the things that are most critical. You, you can focus on everything, but it's going to take you forever and, and, yeah. and cost a bundle. But focus on the the major things. Is that kind of the yeah. point? Yeah. What what I advise is focus on the high risk, high probability. Um, high impact risks to remediate because a risk assessment might identify 250 risks, but out of the 250, you might have 25 that are really high impact, high probability. Those are the risks that you really want to treat. The others you can treat later or the others may bubble up to high based upon changes to your business or the technology. Good point, Fred. Thank you. Um, so part of an information security program and part of the requirements of PCI, DFS, HIPAA, um, uh, New York Shield are the, the safeguards that you have to put in place. So administrative safeguards are all about policy and procedure development, right? Uh, it's all about uh, who is managing your information security program? Do you have a CIO? Do you have a chief information security officer, director of IT, et cetera? Uh, what are you doing to train employees? Because our employees at the end of the day, whether we're developing policies, procedures, or we're implementing technical controls like firewalls and antivirus software, our employees are our best firewall. 
they're really our front line of defense. So educating our employees on what they should and should not click on in an email message, uh, if they get a telephone call, that's our, really our first line of defense. But administrative controls, sorry, Fred, again, uh, they're really about policies and procedure development. The second is physical controls, right, or physical safeguards. So uh, how are we disposing of our PCs? Uh, are we making sure that the hard disk drives or solid state disk drives are being totally wiped per NIST standards? If you recycle them, are you receiving certificates of destruction? Um, how are you securing your computer equipment, uh, whether they're laptops, servers, tablets? Um, what are you doing to detect, prevent, and respond to a physical intrusion, right? Uh, what, what are those policies and procedures and plans uh, that you have in place to do that? And then technical safeguards. So um, really technical safeguards are what is called security in depth. And think of security in depth as an onion, right? At the center of the onion is whatever the heck it's called. Uh, but all the layers around it are protecting the center. And that's what we do. Uh, to reduce the risk of a breach, right? Uh, and, that, and, and that center of the onion is our data. The reason why ransom is so high it is because data today is worth more than gold, silver, or oil. In fact, data is the new gold and data is the new oil. Uh, so we have to do something and have security in depth to protect that. So operating systems are updated, anti-malware, having a security operations center, having companies like Steve's and, um, and Fred's protect your information and test in terms of how secure you really are by performing ethical hacking, uh, as Steve's firm does. Uh, Fred providing continuous monitoring, making sure that all of your operating systems, your antivirus, your firewalls are up to date, as well as recommending new technology because technology changes. Full disk encryption. If you lose a laptop and it's fully disk encrypted and it has DFS related information or New York State resident information, and I will guarantee you all of your laptops do, whether you know it or not, you don't have to report to the state because it's almost impossible to unencrypt an encrypted disk drive. However, if you do lose it, it's a breach and you're gonna need to report to the state. Uh, so all of these, uh, all of these uh, things. So uh, let me summarize because we have a bunch of questions that I know need to be answered. Information security programs are uh, really all about uh, people, process, and technology, right? educating employees, getting policies and procedures in place that, oh, by the way, we all follow and we can prove that we're following them. Um, risk assessments that are involved in the information security program. And then the technical and physical controls that we would put in place, as well as working with companies such as either Foxpoint, CE Tech, or SMT to really ensure that you have a sound information security program. So with that, I'm gonna thank everybody and hand it back over to Sue. Thank you, John. Um, I, I know we're running short on time, so just quickly, um, just a reminder, um, we will be following up with everybody uh, with a dark web scan report using the credentials that you provided when you register for this webinar and the ransomware guide. Um, we would, at the conclusion of this webinar, um, we have a very simple two question survey. We'd love some feedback about how we're doing. It definitely um, helps us. And I guess I will, um, before we hit the question and answers, I'll just leave with, you know, today we try to keep this lighthearted and entertaining, but in all seriousness, this is a very significant, uh, important topic. Cybercrime, as we discussed, is a multi-billion, with a B, billion dollar a year business, forever impacting people's livelihoods and businesses. Uh, one in five businesses, small or medium-sized businesses, will suffer a breach this year. One million new cybersecurity threats are released each and every day. 
So please do not wait till it's too late. If you learned anything, please don't wait till it's too late. Take some action now. And I'll leave you with the biggest danger is your complacency. Success breeds complacency, complacency breeds failure, and only the paranoid survive. So we are here to help. I'm gonna leave this screen up during question and answers so you have all of our contact information, but um, we do this stuff all day, every day. We do know what it takes. Um, we work together, we're partners. If you don't know where to uh, start, reach out to any one of us and we'll, uh, we'll get you pointed in the right direction. So with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Andrew um, that's gonna uh, talk to, uh, go through the questions. Thanks, Sue. Um, well, the first question is, um... I got multiple times is how how do I uh, know if my current IT provider is protecting my company properly? I guess this would be to Fred or whoever wants to start. Yeah, I'll I'll take a stab at that one. I mean, it, it only makes sense to get a uh, uh, a third party assessment. I mean, just like if you're going to the doctor and they diagnose something, um, it, it makes sense to get a second opinion, right? Um, we we do that. We have quite an extensive uh, assessment program. It's a lot different than others, and um, if you're, if any anybody out there, um, CIO, CFO, owner of a business, or even the IT people want a quick check on how they're doing, um, we'll be we'll be happy to do that assessment for you. And incidentally, uh, all three of us work together, so feel free to contact Fred, Steve, or myself. But um, for instance, uh, we provide penetration testing. So the second answer to that question is to really know for sure is a vulnerability assessment and a penetration test. Uh, we provide that through Steve and Steve's company. Um, so make sure that you, you should all feel free to contact any one of us, regardless of what your uh, needs are. But that was a good question. Okay, uh, one is here is uh, my company is bidding on government contracts. Uh, what's involved with being compliant? I guess that's a John question. Is it, uh, if, it's, if it's a government contract related to the Department of Defense, the Department of Defense has just announced uh, what's called CMMC certification that all contractors and subcontractors of contractors who are working on Department of Defense contracts uh, must be CMMC certified, which is an information security uh, certification. Yes, it involves uh, the creation of policies and procedures and controls to ensure that you are protecting the government's um, information. So uh, there, there's going to be more information. This is a brand new certification. It was just announced um, probably the beginning of 2020. Uh, the Department of Defense still has not formulated what they're going to require, uh, but we are becoming early assessors. Uh, so if it's a DOD related, uh, that's what needs to be done, and, and we can always provide you more information. Okay. Question is here is, uh, if we get locked up or a company gets locked up with ransomware, uh, how are payments negotiated? Like, I, the people don't know how to get Bitcoin. I guess is the question. So do I do, should a company directly, um, let me read this again, should the company directly uh, interface with the criminals or what do I do? Uh, I can answer that. I, I would never negotiate with them out of the gate. The first thing, call somebody number one. The second thing is if you immediately respond back to who you are and what happened, they got you by the hook even worse. I, I think what you need to do is call somebody that can deal with the incident. If you have to pay, like for example, we've negotiated more ransoms we ever wanted to. The first thing we do is we use an anonymous identity. We leverage it through Proton Mail, you know, through uh, Gorilla Mail, uh, Tutanana Mail is another one that we use, but we hide our identity as well. And then they're going to give you instructions based upon some marker, perhaps let's say a code that they're going to give you. They're going to marry that up with the ransom because they've, they've ransomed hundreds of companies possibly. You're just in the mix now. And then when you start, when you let somebody negotiate, we're going to try to figure out basically how much to pay this guy. If he wants 2 million bucks, you don't want to give him 2 million bucks. If you could follow, let's say his wallet ID for Bitcoin across the blockchain and find out that the guy has only been accepting ransoms for $50,000, hell no, is that guy going to get $2 million? You're going to start off at, let's say 5K and work from there. You know, if you figure out that, let's say you need more time, We've dealt with enough of these guys that you know what buttons to push and what not to push. You can say, hey, listen, you know, we're having a hard time getting Bitcoin. 
Uh, management doesn't understand the risk. They don't understand what's happened here. We have got to explain them. But um, keeping the guy on the hook for as long as you, you can, um, not paying him the, what he wants is a big deal. And then finding out number two, you know, once again, if he's actually exfiltrated data, because if that happens, then even if you can recover, it's different. You never want to negotiate on your own. I, I can't tell you, but uh, it's not like a sales pitch here. You want to have an expert do it. And somebody who's done it a lot, um, it, it could be a, a devastating blow if you overpay and find out that they don't give you a key and uh, some of the other issues that happen along with having to deal with some of these guys. Okay. Another question is, is there a way to find out uh, if a hacker is residing inside my network? John mentioned that earlier. Is there a way to detect a person residing there? I could answer that too, if you want. Um, sure. Yeah, typically, I mean, we, We've seen it before where the threat actors moving around and these guys, you know, they move low and slow. They're not going to be loud and proud. They want to, they want to, they want to touch a system, go away. They want to get as much information as they can. They want to find the hot data that's going to give them the biggest bang for their buck. So if you're doing things like managing logs, if you have a seam in place, if you have a managed security service offering that gives you some visibility or insight, you might be able to find out what he's, you know, what's happening and who's on the inside. You know, he may do something that triggers an event that finally gets a red flag where you can say, holy crap, I got a bad guy in here. So, you know, buying some of these tools, it's not a sales pitch. It's, it's really, they're helpful tools. And they're, you know, when an incident happens, it's the, one of the first things we go to to figure out, hey, where's this guy been? How long has he been inside of here? And how do we put a bullet in him? So really important that, you know, uh, if you see something happening that's uh, questionable, look at it more closely and find out if you got a, a threat actor moving around inside your network. Okay. Yeah, I'd like to tag on the, onto that. I mean, it's it's you know, IT is no longer wait and see what happens. Um, you you can't you can't just wait and see if somebody's in your network. You need to be looking for them. You need to be looking through the logs. You need to have software looking for people in your network. And if you're not doing that, then there's a good chance that you know somebody could be in there and, um, and they're just waiting for the right Friday to hit you. Um, so it, it's no longer acceptable just to call the IT guy when there's a problem. You really need a company that's gonna be you know, setting you up for proactive monitoring and, um, and, and looking for this so you don't get hit before you get hit. Great. Um, another question is, uh, my company is mostly cloud-based. Everything's running in the cloud. Do I have to worry about anything? Oh my gosh. So you know who loves the cloud is, is we do. We don't have to replace hard drives, right? Um, we don't have to go out to people's sites. It's all in the cloud. The cloud is servers somewhere else. Whether you put the servers in your data closet or you put it in the cloud, it's still a server. And somebody has to configure that server. And if, if the guy or gal who's configuring your server is maybe a college graduate or doing it on the side or helping you out and they don't know what they're doing. It doesn't matter if it's in the cloud or in your data center, it could be misconfigured and somebody might have access to that. So um, yeah, by all means, whether it's in the cloud or it's on premise, you, you need to make sure you're taking precautions. These companies aren't gonna do it for you. I mean, people, people don't understand that Office 365, there's no backup product built into that. It's a trash can product. If you if somebody empties the trash can, you may or may not get your data back. And, and the same thing with Google. It's a trash can concept. If, if somebody hacks into your administrative password and starts deleting accounts and data, you may or you may not get your data back. So yeah, whether it's in the cloud or on-premise, you, you got to have somebody paying attention to that stuff. I don't know, Steve or John, if you, you guys have any thoughts on that. Yeah, I, I, um, I mean, look, look. If you get a room full of North Korean PhD computer scientists and they want to get into Microsoft, they're going to get into Microsoft. Now, uh, does Microsoft have a team? Of, they probably have 5,000 information security people watching over their stuff. Uh, but uh, nothing, you know, again, unplug from the internet, don't have a computer. That's the only way you know that you're going to be 100% safe. But Fred is absolutely right. These people are just providing the platform. They're not providing the configuration management and the alerting and the logging and to make sure that nobody is routing around that specific Office 365 or Amazon Web Services environment. They, they provide information security, but not as much as we 
uh, or Fred or Steve's company would because somebody still has to administer it. Okay. Uh, this question is for John specifically. It says, um, if my company gets locked up a, a ransomware, um, no, excuse me, is my, da my data is stolen uh, and it's found on the dark web, can I remove it? How do I get it removed? So um, <laughs> the, uh, I, Steve can answer this question better than I, but I would assume uh, like any IT person, uh, not only is the data on the dark web, but that hacker has also made about 15 backups of it. So, and may have already placed those 15 backups and 15 other dark web sites that are available. So, uh, but Steve, why don't you expand this, on that a little yeah, bit? Yeah, this, this goes back. If, if you were the unfortunate victim of a ransomware scenario where your data was exfiltrated and you didn't pay, and you kept it quiet, and then all of a sudden you hunted it down, you found it for sale on the dark web. At that point, you have an obligation to report because because it happens to people where they keep their mouth shut. They don't say anything. But if somebody else brings it to light that your data was stolen or two FBI agents walk into your office and tell you, it's going to be really embarrassing. At that point, you have an obligation. And that's why, you know, all the policies and procedures and all the regulatory acts that, you know, John just talked about. You know, they're out there to protect the little guy, you know, the poor consumer, the guy that doesn't understand how he got hacked or hit as a result of somebody, some company's breach. So, you know, yesterday was a, was a rude awakening. It was, you know, when Mandiant, which is also now known as FireEye, gets breached, which, by the way, this is the company when a Sony gets hit or when, let's say, you know, a giant company like Equifax gets nailed. They call Mandiant. They call FireEye to help them put the pieces back together. When FireEye got hit, it, 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 was in a, it was a rude awakening to say that we're all vulnerable. And they did the right thing. They reported on what was stolen. I don't know if they've reported everything that was stolen, but if you find your stuff, you got to report. You have an obligation. And you know, I think when you report, John, you kind of got to go through some hoops with the state, probably the Fed. But you yeah, in, in, in this, in, in terms of reporting, if you have everything in place, um, regardless of what the regulation is, whether it's HIPAA or PCI or whatever the state regulations are, they're not naive enough to think that uh, because you have all this stuff in place, you've prevented an attack. Right, so they're going to hold you liable. That's not that's not it. What they want to make sure is you have everything in place, you've done all the right things, and stuff happens. And they know that nobody is impervious for for an attack. The people that get in the trouble are the ones that don't report immediately and say they have a written information security plan that the state requires. And when the state comes in and says, show it to me, they have like a PowerPoint, one slide that says, here's our written information security plan. Okay. Uh, someone says my website is hosted through GoDaddy. Aren't they experts in, on security for me? Yeah. I. I, I... So GoDaddy, GoDaddy is a is a big company. They're a great company, but we've we've had several customers host their sites on GoDaddy and actually pay for the additional security package for their website and and get breached. But it's not about GoDaddy or whatever company you go with. It's really about somebody paying attention to the details, right? So um, I'd say uh, you know I I like I like I like. I like our customers to hire website companies that are actually doing the monitoring and, and the ongoing maintenance of the website versus just farming that out to a GoDaddy. Um, GoDaddy does, you know, they're kind of like a Walmart. They're, they're selling a lot of stuff at reasonable prices. But um, if you think that GoDaddy's looking out for the best interest of, the, of your company, I, I, I wouldn't recommend it. They really provide, I mean, it, it, as Fred said, they're a huge company. They're a good company, but some of these offerings are they're providing a false sense of security. So your extra $10 a month or $25 a month. Yeah, they've added on extra, extra security controls, but it's really not to the same extent that 
uh, CE Tech or ST or Fox Point or Mandiant or anybody else would provide. Yeah, John, I think you could buy their extra security for about the same price as a cup of coffee. So, I mean, that's what you're getting is a cup of coffee security. Right. Okay, another question is, um, my company has IT, internal IT, um, and I don't necessarily want to outsource, uh, but are there ways that you can still help my IT, my IT department? Yeah, we do. Uh, our, our company does support for companies who need full support, and then we do a lot of support for companies who have their own IT department. And what we can do in those cases is um, we, we have a lot of tools that help um, do a lot of the heavy lifting, like patching and monitoring and things like that. And so we, we're, we're a supplement to those, those IT people. And, and actually, those are, those are engagements we really enjoy. We, we like working with other IT people and helping them out. And so um, absolutely. And uh, I, I know that um, you know, both Steve and John work with a lot of companies that have their own internal IT. Um, I, I don't think any of us are suggesting um, you know, outsourcing, you know, large components of your company. I think what we're, we're, what we're recommending is, you know, there's, you've got three people, this is all they do all day, every day. And, and if you need a helping hand, you know, we're, we're there to help you out. So. Okay. Finishing this up. Uh, this one is definitely for Steve. It says, how do the dark market vendors ship uh, hard products like drugs and physical items? Um. No, Andrew, why is that a question from you, Andrew, or is that a question from the lobby? Well, maybe. I mean, the there's, holidays are approaching. <laughs> there's always there, that's that's the number one question when the dark web comments always come up. It's I get that all the time, and I'll tell you, it's an interesting. Um, so there's 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 two answers. There's a technical answer, and then there's a real answer. The technical answer is how do guys do it? They buy whatever they want to buy in the dark web, and when they have a, an address to give to the dark market vendor. What they do is they find an apartment complex with a vacant apartment and a lobby that's accessible from the street with no locked door. So you have it mailed to that location and then um, you wait. And then when your package arrives, you can go in there and rummage through and check it. Um, and if it's there, you don't get it yet. You send somebody else in to pick it up for you in case the authorities are waiting for you. Now that's the technical answer. The real answer is you have it shipped to John's house and you're all set. So you go from there, but that that is really technically how a lot of guys do it. Uh, we'll do we'll do we'll do one more question here because we've gone really long. Um, is what do I need to be Shield Act compliant? So to be Shield Act compliant, uh, you need a uh, risk assessment to be performed, a written information security plan to be written. Um, supporting policies and the policies that I named in my towards the front of my side, uh, slide would suffice. Uh, you need to have a vulnerability assessment uh, and penetration test. Um, and the appropriate um, uh, physical and uh, technical safeguards. And technical safeguards, really SHIELD isn't all that um, cumbersome. Most of us have antivirus. Most of us have hopefully a firewall. Uh, some of us also use intrusion prevention systems, et cetera. Uh, so you also need to have those uh, administrative controls are the policies and procedures. Uh, physical controls are door locks and then the technical controls, antivirus, uh, anti-malware. So those are really the com main components of uh, the New York Shield Act and what's required. Very good. We've gone really long. I want to thank everyone. I think we'll wrap up the webinar. Anyone else have anything else to add before we sign off? Nope. Just thank you, everybody. Thanks a lot. Thank thanks you, for everyone. attending. Bye. All right, thanks. Bye -bye. Thanks, everyone. Goodbye.